Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. Um, in this video I just wanted to take a minute to talk about quality of evidence. We've been talking a lot about different papers and studies done on COVID-19 and I feel like I haven't spent enough time on the channel talking about the quality of those studies um, because quality of evidence is important, right? If you have a poor quality study that says something and you take that as fact, that may be incorrect conclusion because the quality of that study was so poor that the conclusion they came up with may not be the actual conclusion. So I wanted to talk about quality of evidence as related to different types of studies. And this is a pyramid that is often used, you can find it you know, all over the internet, that uh, shows quality of evidence as the pyramid gets higher. And as the pyramid gets higher, the uh, uh, blocks get smaller because higher quality evidence has fewer studies. So there's much fewer high quality studies than there are low quality studies. And that's what this is meant to represent. The other thing I wanted to talk about here was what each type of study is, what its advantages and disadvantages are. And I think this is going to be valuable for those of you who are starting to look at more studies now that, you know, COVID has been around to try to determine, you know, where we're at in the pandemic, what therapies are helpful, et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully this is a video everyone can refer back to when trying to determine the quality of the study and then take that into consideration when gauging whether that conclusion is one that we can act on. So at the top we have systemic reviews, right? So systemic reviews are meta-analyses and then systemic reviews. These are both at the top of the pyramid. So although it just says systemic reviews, meta-analysis is up here as well. What are these two things? Well, a meta-analysis is actually a method of combining the results of independent studies, which are in the published literature, and then synthesizing conclusions. So meta-analysis can actually combine, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of studies together, take all that data, and then analyze all that data to come up with a conclusion. So it's a really powerful modality because it can look at, you know, 50 moderate um, quality or even low moderate quality studies, put all those together and then look at the conclusions from all that combined data, which is a much higher level of evidence than each one of those individual studies. I think, you know, something like hydroxychloroquine is a perfect example of this. We have all these studies on hydroxychloroquine out there, um, and we're starting to get some higher level studies now, but um, all these studies on hydroxychloroquine, and there's tons of different conclusions, right, from these studies. And it gets confusing. So what a meta-analysis could do is look at all these studies, put all these studies together, and then determine, you know, what the overall conclusion is if you looked at all those studies together. A systematic review is looks at all published, right, so all the studies, as well as unpublished material on a specific question. It also judges the methods and combines both the quantitative, so this is numbers, like published studies, as well as the qualitative, which is things like, you know, expert opinion and unpublished material. So this is sub more subjective, less number driven um, on their similarity. So it's kind of similar to a meta-analysis with the uh, change being they can look at unpublished material as well and take that into account. Whereas the meta-analysis is just looking at, you know, published uh, independent studies and combining them together. So these are the highest quality um, evidence out there. And we don't really have, I don't think at least at this point, correct me if I'm wrong, any meta-analyses or systemic reviews out there on COVID-19. So then we come up here. You have this kind of general critically appraised topics and articles. This is just like... Um, um, overview articles on the evidence and information out there on a topic, but it's not something we really are looking at um, currently. So next after that is randomized control trials, right? RCTs. And we're starting to get more and more randomized control trials in the COVID literature. Although I guess I shouldn't talk about just COVID specifically for this uh, video because quality of evidence is important for all different types of studies. But randomized control trials is the next level of uh, quality. And a randomized control trial, right, We most people are more familiar with randomized control trials than some of these other trials. It's a, an experimental comparison in which patients get allocated to either a treatment group or a control group 
and it's done randomly. So people agree to be in the study, right? This person says, yes, I'll be in the study. And then they randomly get assigned to either the control group or the treatment group. They don't have a say in it. And if it's blinded, right, then the researchers and the patients don't know. And that's important because that helps um, change and take out biases. Because if the researchers and the patients don't know what arm of the study they're in, they won't get treated any differently, right? Let's say that the, the doctor knows that the patient's in the um, control arm. They might be more worried about the patient and take, keep a closer eye on that patient than they do patients in the treatment arm, which might change the outcomes of the study. So blinded randomized control trials are of high value. So what are the advantages and disadvantages here? Well, it's unbiased, right? Because you're randomly assigning patients, right? You're not choosing which group the patient goes to. Blinding is more likely, and that's what we talked about here, right? Blinding means that people don't know who is in what group except for a third party that isn't involved in the analysis. Um, and that helps take out um, biases and confounding variables as well. And then randomization facilitates statistical analysis. The randomization is what we talk about, you know, it helps us match the two groups together and take out any confounding variables. Um, this is important and you might say, well, can't you just match groups? Um, you know, you can just look and make sure the groups are well matched and that your control group is representative of your intervention group. You can, but the challenge with that is that um, randomization allows matching even for confounders that we're not aware of, right? So we can only actively match two groups together with confounding variables that we're aware of, comorbidities, age, sex. But there's other things that might be affecting these diseases that we don't know about. And randomization allows us to randomly match those things we don't even know about so that they're not affecting the results. Uh, disadvantages of this are that they're expensive, time and money, right? This is the, the big issue with these studies is that they take a long time, they cost a lot of money, and they take a lot of manpower, um, man and woman power as well. Uh, patients have to volunteer, right? Uh, think about being a patient and saying, yes, I volunteer to either be in a placebo arm or the treatment arm. I agree that I'm not going to know which one um, until maybe the end of the study or maybe not at all. And that's kind of a big thing to volunteer for is agreeing to be in this type of study. Um, not many patients will agree to this type of thing. Um, ethically problematic at times. What do they mean by that? Well, again, I don't mean, keep mean to talk about COVID-19, but it's a good example, right? Because um, some researchers feel like certain COVID-19 therapies work. And to randomize a patient to a placebo instead of that therapy could ethically cause problems, at least for that individual. Because that individual, if they think that therapy works, would be saying that they're okay with patients not getting that therapy in the placebo arm. And that's ethically problematic. Um, so there are some ethical challenges in randomized control trials sometimes. All right, so let's go back up to our pyramid. So, so far we have talked about randomized control trials. We just kind of skipped over this middle one and half mentioned it. And then we talked about systemic reviews and meta-analyses. So what's next? Cohort studies. So this is one that um, at least those who have you been following our channel have probably seen a lot of, but I don't know if I ever really explained what a cohort study is. And this is the next highest level of evidence underneath randomized controlled trials. So a cohort study is when data is obtained from groups who have been exposed or not exposed to a new technology or factor of interest or medication No allocation of exposure is made by the researcher. So the researcher isn't choosing allocation. Best for study effective predictive risk factors. So a cohort is essentially you look at your, let's say uh, we're looking at hydroxychloroquine. Well, if we we're going to do a retrospective cohort, we'd be looking back in time. So a retrospective cohort would mean that we are at a hospital and we're saying we want to see differences in mortality between those who got hydroxychloroquine and those who didn't. Well, we're going to find patients who have already received hydroxychloroquine and compare those to patients who had not received hydroxychloroquine and go back in time and look at that.
if we're going to do a prospective cohort, we're going to look forward in time. And what this means is that we're going to say, we want to know if there's a difference in mortality between those who get hydroxychloroquine and those who don't. So we are going to start the trial now, and we are going to wait, and we're going to see which patients get hydroxychloroquine and compare those to which patients don't get hydroxychloroquine from this point forward and see if there's a difference between the two. Hopefully that makes sense. In the comments, let us know if that's confusing, but you're just looking at those who have been exposed. You're not randomizing patients. You're not you know, choosing who does or doesn't get the medication. You are just saying, hey, I'm observing. I am going to observe which patients get a medication. You know, the doctors choose to give that patient a medication. I have no involvement in who gets the medication or who doesn't, but I'm going to compare those who do get it with those who don't get it, either looking back in time retrospectively or looking forward in time prospectively. So advantages, ethically these are safe because you are not involved in choosing who does or doesn't get the medication. The provider has complete control over it. And that provider, you know, sometimes doesn't even know if it's, if the patient is gonna be in a study, the provider's just choosing what they think is best for the patient. Subjects can be matched, but remember, we talked about this above, just with known variables. So when you do a cohort study, you can say, I'm gonna make sure everybody in, you know, the control group and the treatment group have a similar number of comorbidities, a similar age, a similar gender, a similar severity of disease, et cetera, all those known variables, but you can't match for variables you don't know about. So things that we don't think about or things that we don't yet know about a disease might still not be matched properly between the groups, even though the groups look well matched when you're kind of looking at those tables. You can establish timing and directionality. Uh, eligible criteria can be standardized, right? Only patients that are between 50 and 70 who are male who have severe disease. We're only going to look at that standard group of patients and then see within that standard group who got hydroxychloroquine who didn't compare the two. Um, they're easier and cheaper than randomized control trials. And this is why, you know, we see more cohort studies than RCTs because it's easier to do. Disadvantages controls may be difficult to identify if a treatment is thought to be effective, not many people are not going to get the treatment. And that may be linked to hidden confounders. Uh, I shouldn't say that. That's not necessarily true. Um, this may be linked to confounders because why didn't the people who didn't get the group, why didn't get the treatment, why did those patients not get the therapy? You know, what about them made them not get the therapy? Because that in and of itself means they're different than the patients who did get the therapy. Blinding can be difficult. Um, exposure may be linked to a hidden confounder. We kind of talked about that up here, right? Is that you can match for known variables, but you can't match for unknown or hidden variables. You can't randomize. You know, the nature of the study means it's not possible to randomize. And then for rare diseases, large sample size or long follow-up may be necessary because you're waiting and waiting and waiting for people to get or not get your intervention. All right, so this I would say thus far is kind of the most common study we've talked about are these cohort studies. You'll often see me write something like observational, prospective, cohort, which means that we are looking forward in time at patients who did or did not get a therapy. They're not randomized patients because we're just observing and comparing those two groups. All right, so let's go back up to our pyramid. So now we covered cohort studies, right? And this is kind of the most common, at least thus far on the channel that we've talked about. So next is case controlled series or case series or reports. So case control studies. This is uh, when patients with a certain outcome or disease and appropriate group of controls without the outcome or disease are selected usually with careful consideration for controls and matching, and then the information is obtained on whether the subjects have been exposed to a factor under investigation. So this gets you know a little bit confusing. The difference here is that we are looking at an outcome, and then we are seeing if they were exposed to a factor so let's say we want to do a case control series on you know mortality and hydroxychloroquine we're going to look at 
those who have died from COVID-19, COVID-19 deaths, and then we are going to look to see, you know, how many of those patients got hydroxychloroquine, right, who were exposed to a factor under investigation, and then compare that to a matched control group. Does that make sense? So these studies are quicker and cheaper. They are only feasible for rare disorders or those that lag with a long exposure time and there's fewer subjects needed. We're not gonna talk about cross-sectional studies in this video, I don't think, because uh, they're not, you know, we haven't been talking about many of them, but if they start to come up in the literature um, that we cover on the channel, we can go into detail on them. Uh, disadvantages, their reliance on recall or records to determine exposure status. So some of these studies, you know, require a person to recall what happened during that time you're looking back on. There's lots of confounders. A control group is difficult to select. There's lots of biases, selection biases, recall biases. So we haven't been looking at too many case control studies as well. Um, we have been looking at case series um, but not many case control studies. So I think the big ones to try to put to mind are cohort studies, randomized control trials, and then these meta-analysis and systemic reviews. And always remember when you're looking at a study, look at what the quality of evidence is because that is significant, you know, super important when determining whether the outcome of that study, the conclusion, is something that can be depended upon. All right, let us know what thoughts, questions, comments you have down below. Uh, feel free to subscribe and follow along, and we'll see you all next time.